Hey everybody, welcome back to our weekly podcast. My name is Patrick Tan, the uh, general counsel for Chain Argos. We're the blockchain intelligence firm that first discovered Binance's 1.4 billion US dollar under collateralization. Of course, we've done a lot more since then. Stuff that you guys have talked about with me um, every week as usual, uh, my partner in crime, Jonathan Reiter, our CEO and chief data scientist. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for all the comments, the likes and subscribes. We really appreciate that. Um, we could probably do a lot better than where we are right now in terms of subscription. I understand this isn't everybody's cup of tea. We've had multiple complaints about me speaking too quickly. Um, there's a way to adjust the the playback speed on your player uh, wherever available. Uh, but otherwise, we have to talk about a couple of things this week. Um, three things mainly. <coughs> the first one is um, some of the stuff that we discovered and tweeted about with respect to... Well, posted about i guess that's just the correct term right now um stuff related specifically to um hamas uh the hezbollah the islamic jihad the terrorist terrorist financing stuff um with respect to the actual flows uh we'll talk a little bit about the nyag's uh, dcg genesis lawsuit and finally we'll talk about some of the tether mechanics and I, i i get that there is some confusion as to um, a lot of people are pointing to that thirty odd billion dollars worth of um, tether that supposedly went into Alameda, um, and there's some misconceptions as to where is that money? Does it exist? Has it gone somewhere? We'll talk about that in in a while. <clears throat> so right, we'll, we'll just um, jump straight into it, and, and let's just look a little bit at basically um, what we posted. So basically, um, the Israeli authorities listed a whole bunch of Tron wallet addresses that would process and and we obviously did those scans um elliptic did a report about it um the wall street journal picked up that story uh, published it and we went to verify i think the number the final number was something like 93.7 million dollars something along those lines um <coughs> we verified those numbers and they were accurate um based on based on on us tracking the flows um, but on top that's of just the volumes, yeah, the that's just the volume, yeah, yeah, that's, correct. That's, that's, so that's I, 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 straightforward calculation. So we we then moved on to to see the interactions between that and what we finally found, which a lot of you guys found interesting, is that the total flows based on wallets which Israel has identified as belonging to terrorist organizations to, tops off at around a billion. I, I I'm not sure that they actually say belonging to. Yes, correct. Affiliated, affiliated with, with correct. Yeah, okay. So this is going to become important. In a moment. Yes, yes, correct. So all. I want to point out is that that's all we did. We said these are the wallets which Israel has um, yeah. identified as being associated, affiliated, oh. or identified as belonging to. Yeah. It could be any one of those things. So they're not clear. In, just just to be clear, they're not clear. Well, I mean, so when I guess okay, we, we can skip ahead and then come back to the clean out. <coughs> I mean, what happens here is if you have some sanctioned bad actor and they use a money transmitter service, uh, you know, colloquially a Western Union kind of thing, um, that Western Union going to get shut down too. Yeah. Right? Um, it doesn't mean that they're part of the same organization, but when they block you, they often block. I mean, if it's a large bank, it's a bit of a carve out situation, but smaller currency exchange dealer, gold trader, whatever um, commodity stuff is used to smuggle this all over the world. Um, yeah, okay, so sorry. That's, that's the, the distinction there. So the important thing to remember is that all we did was we tracked the flows into it. I don't think anybody, not Elliptic, not the Wall Street Journal, not us, uh, said that, oh, there's a billion dollars worth of terrorist flows. A billion dollars worth of arms is quite a lot. Well, it's okay. I mean, I think you have two different things <coughs> here. One of them is a conflation of the sort of actual bad actor, sanctioned whatever character, and people who um, somebody else referred to them as service providers, money services businesses, would have writ, writ broadly, um, and a stock versus flow difference, right? So we could kind of take the second one first. This is a classic economics problem. You know, if you have fifty million dollars of float at any one time yeah. and process a billion dollars of payments, yeah. is that a billion dollars or fifty million dollars? Right. This is actually some of the confusion with FTX will come to a bit later. It's both, depending on what you're talking about. It's like biweekly. Well, anyway, don't use the word biweekly because it means both every two weeks and every whatever twice a week. Don't and do twice that. a week. Don't do that. Anyway, sorry. Um, and you have an issue here where if some of the sanctioned addresses are money services businesses of this of this sort then yeah not 100 percent of those flows are bad and you know if i transfer 100 dollars into the money services business and then out of the money services business and then that wallet distributes it as salary to five people is that a hundred dollars is it three hundred dollars is it two hundred dollars you know how do you define that 
these are classic issues with stock versus flow in economics. If you Google stock versus flow, you'll see this all over the place. Anyone that's looking at payment <coughs> networks is familiar with that distinction. The gross flows are one number. The net amounts being distributed to end users are different amounts. Fine. Um, it's hard to tell. So, okay, so that's a standard economics definition that you have to be careful about. So if we say we see, for example, a billion dollars of flow here, yeah. we don't mean anybody has a billion dollars. We mean a billion dollars. Gross is the amount that moved among all the nodes in this network. And that's a standard definition. That, that's fine. What I, found, what I found interesting was that nobody said that a billion dollars was applied to terrorist financing. Yeah, I mean, the, if, if you had a net amount of money going from point A to point B of a billion dollars, the transactions of the network would be a hundred, would be super, super huge. Which, which is why I would, I would find it surprising if anybody would to say that, that it's grossly overstated because nobody said that. Well, okay. Anyway. Um, and you have a separate <coughs> issue, which is are the end user recipients. So if you see a wallet that's receiving a thousand dollars every couple of weeks and it's the you know end of this and then it goes out in real retail type amounts, almost certainly that is the bad actor. That's on the list. That's an individual whatever, individual person, individual business, individual whatever, wallet address. Yeah, if you have another intermediary that's processing large numbers of payments into and out of a lot of addresses, many of the people who receive from there may not be a problem or might be a problem. Um, so uh, understanding that difference is, is, is important. Uh, it is also very difficult to understand, you know, let's say you have a dodgy money changer that's involved in this and ends up being sanctioned. What fraction of the business of that dodgy money changer is dodgy people? The, the, the issues are many layers, and right, right on down to the end user. Now, terrorism financing. If the money is used to pay for... A good example is um, 9-11, right? They were paid for flying lessons. You could say that that's linked to the final act. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, but if they pay for food and lodging, does that count? Oh, actually, that's interesting. So if you think of a large operation that you know people know about, this, this has happened before <coughs> in the world, clearly... You know, and think about all the payments required for everybody's rent and travel and school and the rest of it. What you're now seeing when you look at these networks is all those payments historically for a long period of time. Is feeding the guy for a year cost $100,000. Is that part of this or not? That's these a political of, question. Yeah, it's a different sort of question how that works. Uh, but you're going to see numbers that probably do seem bigger than expected because the end thing costs 200 bucks to do or $1,000 to do or so, whatever. But the, the support infrastructure is also visible here. Yeah. And the people that they wash the money through or facilitate payment transfers, whatever, that you're going to probably see numbers that are much bigger than expected, but also because the definition is not the same as it used to be. Which is why I think, right, that when it comes to um, estimating how much yeah. of this money is actually used in terrorism financing, Overestimating is not necessarily better or worse than underestimating. So we just, well, just hear me out here. If we overestimate, think about it this way. Because the, the, the issue that I think everybody's trying to draw attention to is the fact that, look, um, USDT seems to figure very large in, in these flows. <coughs> and if that's the, the so-called ill that we're trying to, 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 to cure for, then over Think about it this way. If you needed to, say, fund the guys, make sure that they have clothes, food, lodging, all the yeah, logistics. Payroll for the organization. Correct, right? payroll not, for the organization. Yeah, yeah. Then, then you want to calculate, those, you want to include those bits it's, because yeah. that operation would not have been possible because yeah. if, if the tether wasn't available, then they would have had to use cash, no, it's, which it's, is more tricky. It's not a crazy way of, of, of doing stuff. Now, if you have a, a service provider, an intermediary payment, whatever business, how do you figure out what fraction of their customers are dodgy? You know, 20 years from now, there will be academic forensic studies of some wallet address associated with some money changers that ended up in prison. And people will, oh, this one was 40%, this one was 9%, this one was 97%. Uh, there has been work like this sort of before when the uh, SNL crisis in the U.S. late 80s, early 90s. You know, there was research done later figuring out what fractions of mortgages at individual uh, savings and loans, banks, thrifts, whatever, um, were associated with you know, insider adjacent, dodgy project, basically money stolen, you know, it, there was a lot of bad stuff going on in commercial real estate in the U.S. late 80s, early 90s. It takes a long time to estimate those numbers, assuming that 1% is bad, probably not reasonable. Assuming 99% is a problem, it's also not reasonable. Yeah. But again, this is a well-known problem in the world, and these are challenging <coughs> things to talk about. Um, you no. would imagine the further off piste and how bad, you know, people, there's different levels of sanctioned actors, right? And some yeah. of these guys are pretty close to the highest level of sanctioning that you experience. Yeah. You would think that their service providers are not also just dealing with random people making remittances to cover expenses on holiday because those things don't really touch each other a lot. Whereas similarly, if you think of 
uh, marijuana businesses in the U.S. 10, 15 years ago when stuff was somewhat legal but banking was difficult. The money services businesses that helped those guys, whether legal or not, whatever, um, were probably not the same kinds of money services businesses that would deal with you know state-level terrorist actor weapons of mass destruction program type things maybe some of them are we're not experts in that but um you know it's not just some random western union that's getting caught up in this most of the time you would think so one of the things i just wanted to point out is that to me at least um and to the work that we do and and a bunch of other companies do as well trm labs um elliptic just a couple that i can think of over the top of my head to to say that oh okay um you know the, the flows are really not that big. That seems to me to miss the point. Um, the point of the matter is is that, for better or worse, um, an, a, a, what appears to be a more convenient vehicle, um, just simply by dint of the way it's being used, has yeah. been made available to them. Yeah. So whether or not one billion had flowed through, which is the case, one billion worth volume of transactions, was one billion. That's the velocity. Well, also yeah. remember when you're talking about <coughs> flow amounts, so volume amounts. Yeah, you're correct. measuring that against what total on chain volumes, which are huge, huge numbers. Yeah. So these are small fractions of the overall totals. People get confused if they think there's only ten billion of some stablecoin outstanding and a billion were used for this. Yeah, correct. You're That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you're not looking state. at the the, yeah. the same numbers. Yeah. But if you think about that, think also in terms of the fact that um, to, to understand it in maybe layman's terms, would you would it be fair to say that? That's like a billion dollars worth of economic activity. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, well, the way some crypto people define economic activity, I mean, interbank payments are excluded from GDP. Because Correct. It, it doesn't make any sense to yeah. send money back and forth and count that as GDP. So it's, it's not even that. These tend to be the, the largest of numbers for an economy. Yeah. The, the daily amount of interbank transfers may exceed annual GDP. And it's not that anything's being done wrong. It's that you're comparing numbers that are just not... The same. And the other thing I think, which is, is to me, is a, is a disingenuous argument that 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 appears to be being made by uh, out there, is to say that, oh, okay, um, you know what? In in the grand scheme of things, the amount of terrorist financing that this has facilitated is very small compared to all of the other means. However, if ninety percent of the use case for this particular vehicle appears to be this, well, I mean, it's a bit unfair. Well, yeah, to correct. That, I mean, like, and and back, back to the other point, right? To say it's zero, it's, it's wrong. To say it's 99% is wrong as well. And, and, I mean, again, a lot of what we're saying sort of are, are well-known things <coughs> in, in you know, macroeconomics, whatever study of, of economies in general. Uh, also, we know that the, the less KYC type stuff a business does, in many of these cases, the answer is zero. The fraction of ca counterparties who are fraud or, or uh, sanctioned or whatever, bad, bad actors, is higher. This is very well studied that increasing those requirements decreases the fraction of people using the system that are there. There are criminals who use every major bank, but it's not 40%. It's not 1%. It's small numbers. The total number of dollars may be huge, whatever. Um, so you would expect in the case of businesses that are doing very little or zero real KYC AML work that you would see much, much higher fractions yeah. of people. Do not uh, take what you see for a study of a commercial bank where you know $100 million in dodgy payments went through whatever, standard charter, and they do a trillion dollars of payments a day. Don't take that tiny fraction and project that here because these are definitely going to be higher numbers, and this is well studied forever. Do we have specific examples of uh, exchange businesses that got disassembled and forensic research was done on them? No, we do not. Will someone maybe, and this is a good transition to the next topic, will someone do that with like the Genesis Block wallets in Hong Kong at some point? Perhaps, and there will be academic work, and they'll be able to say, we think 40% of the customers were definitely bad, and another 10 to 15% might have been. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. We're also not pretending we know. Um, yeah. You know, okay, it's just to say these are known issues in analyzing payment systems in the world and economic. I, I guess the, LDR, the point the point that we want to make from this first one before we move on to the DCG Genesis thing is that um, in, in, in a challenging time like this, um, I'm surprised. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm sincerely surprised that anybody would try to downplay the the significance or the importance of of this of this. Uh... Well, I mean, but at the same time, it's important that people recognize that no one's claiming twenty percent of all the whatever coins in in use are involved in this stuff. Yes, because you're comparing stock and flow numbers, and that is wrong. So, yeah. All right. So moving on, DCG Genesis, uh, NYAG. Yeah. So finally, um, finally, the uh, chickens have come home to roost. DCG Bruce. Complex is being sued for misrepresentation, harming investors. Uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. They're being sued for misrepresenting the $1.1 billion uh, bailout. 
And so t- tell us a bit about that because some of our some of our listeners might not know. Okay, so following the uh, Luna incident, what is it? Eighteen months ago now, right? May it's ancient history too. Um, Genesis, the trading subsidiary of Digital Currency Group, um, had was defaulted on by Three Arrows Capital and a number of other people and suffered multi-billion dollar losses. Um, exactly the amount still remains to be seen because these guys are in bankruptcy. Yep. Still working through that. And at one point in June or early July 2022, um, Digital Currency Group CEO Barry Silbert announced that they were assuming the liabilities associated with those losses. So they were they presented that they were just going to eat the losses and they were going to make whole the subsidiary so business could keep going forward for a little over a billion dollars. Okay. Um, that is a large conglomerate that certainly has a fair amount of money because as we've discussed many times they collect the fees from the grayscale bitcoin ethereum and other trusts which amount to you know solid over a billion dollars in dollar dollars uh over many many years so it was at least not absurd to think that they might have the money yeah whether or not they did or didn't whatever but this is not a startup nobody's ever heard of with seven employees saying oh we lost two billion dollars we're good uh, my brother's just going to pay for it right it, it wasn't it was a, yeah, yeah this guy might have had the money but with the business there, there was reason to, to to accept that that was a plausible yeah. that uh, outcome. emerged later that instead of actually giving them cash or anything that's you know immediately turnable into cash he didn't even give them giving them actual dollars in a bank account is probably the best to cover losses but you could give them bitcoin you could give them bonds you give them all kinds of stuff they could have given them grayscale trust, whatever, shares, which they could sell in the market. They didn't do any of that. They gave them a promise to pay them the money back in 10 years. This emerged later in 2022. Um, and then eventually they, the company that made that promise, um, the company that received the promise went bankrupt, and then there's been some fighting back and forth. The TLDR here is that soon after this, so this subsidiary suffered large and acknowledged losses, and the parent company said, we made it good, we're fine, don't worry about it. We're going to move on from this. And then later it turned out that they hadn't actually made good at all. They just promised to make good in the future. That subsequently people lost a whole bunch of money in Gemini Earn and all yep. the, the lending programs that, that deposited money into Genesis. And the New York Attorney General is asserting that at least part of those losses are due to this misrepresentation. I'm not sure I agree that the misrepresentation has caused any losses here. These people's money was gone. To begin with. Already. Yes. But he does appear to have, I'm not going to say lied about it, because it is plausible that they found a way to legally do this correctly. But certainly, the impression that was given was that the problem was resolved, and the problem was not resolved. And exhibit A for the problem being not resolved is the company went bankrupt. <coughs> I mean, the Genesis, <coughs> after it was bailed out, then went bankrupt. Because of you know these, these, these losses. So, uh, it's going to be interesting. Um... Uh, again, I would say their best defense is probably the lying wasn't meaningful because their money was already gone. You know, if you're a Gemini Earn that's, depositor, that's now, an I interesting don't know what fraction of the money defense. went in after, right? But people weren't piling huge amounts of money in. You know, I no, I, I think I was bankrupt and lied about it for a year, but uh, your money was gone already. So no, that that's, that is an important distinction because we I've seen in in the past where uh, the prosecutors get a little bit sloppy or. Or they don't fully understand the yeah. issues, and then they don't frame the, the the suit. Oh, I mean, I'm not suggesting they don't understand what's going on. I just think well, the only yeah. defense they've got is this didn't cause anybody to lose any money because we already lost. I them. mean, what's a, yeah, correct, and that and, and what that would what, so that would true. result in is like a mistrial, and then you have to start again from zero. Not to say that they lose the second time, but it would waste a lot of time. Um, I mean, look, he certainly provide, provided a misleading picture of what was going. Yeah, on. Yeah, I get that, but he might have provided a misleading picture on something else that's unrelated oh in, okay. in which case no, i mean like some of these slam dunk cases and i like how about oj you know okay <laughs> so when this podcast is not venturing into terrorist financing and oj simpson let's just move on so i'm just saying that you know with these slam dunk cases sometimes there's there's a there's a danger i i, I feel that you know if you don't oh i'm not properly it's a slam dunk case correct at all, in part because this is not somebody who went out, <coughs> lied, then, then collected got, a whole yeah, bunch correct. of money. Yeah. This is like he lied about having already lost your money. Yeah, and which is a weird it, which situation, a, right? And I don't. That's why I, I didn't fully yeah. understand yeah. why they chose to take that attack because that's not what I would have done. But it's also pretty clear that he misrepresented. No, 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 no. no, 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 no I'm not right, saying that. Right. It's just that you know, if, if you're going to pick your fights, right? Why right. would you pick this one? This is, just doesn't make sense well, to me. That's a huge amount of money, right? And there's an awful lot of. I mean, no, no, I get that. I get that. I just, I mean, from a 
um, from a trial lawyer's like strategy point of view, I just you know it's just strange. That that it just strikes me as strange. Why? I mean, so from some work that that we did, what six eight months ago or so. Uh, the guy who runs Digital Currency Group definitely has a large number of dollars. Yeah. Yes. So probably to avoid actually having to go to trial, he's a wonderful person to negotiate with as yeah. a prosecutor because he would probably be willing to accept some kind of responsibility, make some kind of payment to just make the possibility of having a real criminal thing go away. Uh, I mean, were I to guess what's happening here, the case is not intended to go to a jury. The case is intended to get the New York Attorney General to be able to say, we settled and we helped these however many hundred thousand investors get their money back. Because, I mean, prosecutors in the United States are politicians. And literally true, they're elected in many cases. So, you know, it's, uh, that's probably what's happening. In fact, um, doing something that helps a whole bunch of consumers in New York State as the Attorney General is a great way to get elected governor. Oh, yeah. It's happened many times. Yeah, yeah. So I would not be surprised at all. I'm not saying this is a bad thing either this is the american political system whatever you you yeah i would not be surprised if this was an attempt to get some kind of a high profile settlement like that out of him that they could announce as a victory protecting consumers new york is safe for consumers to use crypto or whatever mission accomplished um, you'd love making that joke anyway i don't think any american politician is ever going to say that phrase again so well okay finally um and this ties up to the first point which is um there is quite a bit of confusion online because as the ftx FTS, uh, well, not the FTX trial, sorry. As the SBF trial uh, continues to unfold, the, uh, one of the questions that's been raised is, um, they said they saw, I, I can't remember the numbers, like 32 billion or something like that, yeah. that was flowing, um, that flowed into yeah. Alameda. <laughs> and, and a very simplistic question, which I saw on crypto Twitter, which is, where is the money? Um, uh, but okay. that's not... <laughs> so you, we, I'm, so uh, Protos originally did <coughs> you know, manually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Big ups uh, to them. Digging through some records and figuring out where most Tether uh, went, who received them, and they identified basically um, Alameda FTX and then something that's affiliated with Binance, Cumberland, DRW, whatever, or the, the biggest receivers, and then a number of other. Um, we, a bit later, were the first people to figure out that, forget slicing by counterparty, if you slice by um, chain, there's also a big split there, and it turns out that FTX, Alameda, whatever, received all, all, almost all of their Tether on Tron. Yep. And they received almost all the Tether on Tron. Yes. And then that Cumberland Binance, whatever thing that, that um, was identified by Protos, all that stuff was on Ethereum. Yes. Right? So they're, they're, this cuts in two different ways. So it wasn't even that these different groups were receiving across multiple chains. Each group primarily, almost exclusively received on uh, uh, the chain of their whatever choice they're using. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, there's differences in that business. Fine. So Alameda... FTX, whatever, um, received, yeah, 30-something billion Tether on, on, on Tron. Yeah. Now, the first thing to say is that is, you know, something like half the Tether at the time, now, whatever. It's yeah, a lot yeah. of Tether. It's, it's, a, it's not a small amount. But there was no wallet that ever had $30 billion in it. Again, yeah. This is a stock versus flow issue. It goes back to the first thing and that we talked about. So, and it isn't like the money is just still sitting there. And exhibit A for that is to just go to one of the explorers it's not there. and sort for largest holdings. There are no wallets. There have never been any wallets that were that huge. The extent to which there are huge Tether holding wallets, they're all Binance and other exchange wallets. Yeah. Mostly Binance. That's true. Super, super huge. It was never there. They were always operating as some kind of a remittance broker money transmitter service whatever it is so money would come in and then they would send the money whatever colloquially the dollars came in that the tether went out um now we do know in the trial basically nothing's come up on this space because this isn't related it's not relevant to taking the customer stuff and defrauding whatever but we can explain at least a little bit <coughs> of why that big pile of money isn't there so we know, it's not, and, it's, and and it's not because somebody took it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not. Be, well, I mean, it went somewhere. But it went somewhere, but it's not like that um, was their business. So um, Genesis Block was a, a subsidiary of that group of companies. Um, continues to have wonderful old interviews up on YouTube. So these guys were doing. They were an OTC desk. So you, you and this is described in detail in interviews of management of that company. You would essentially bring a bag full of cash yes. to the office in Hong Kong. Yes, and then they would give you. Tether or whatever, the crypto of your choice, to the wallet address of your choice. Yes. Presumably that money got into a bank somehow or somebody, whatever. That is not something we investigate. Um, and then the tokens got sent out. Well, maybe these were accounts in Sam's name, in the name of some of the companies, affiliated companies. They bought Genesis. Yeah, Rock, West Rome tries to something like that. Yes. Yeah, maybe it flows through there. But all of that stuff is um, remittance type thing. So they would have received the money and then sent mm. the money to Tether. Yeah. 
in many cases, and some of this is extremely well documented even in public, we know that Tether was banking at Dell Tech. Yes. And we know that Dell Tech maintained outside of the United States things like correspondent bank accounts. Citibank in the UK, for example, I've even tweeted the account number out before. Yes. Um, so we know that there are flows, and I'm assuming, I'll say Genesis Block in quotes, the people doing this OTC desk type, whatever, businesses. Um, that money somehow got into, one imagines, Dell Tech. One imagines through one of those offshore banking type routes. And that money's now tethers, and the tokens were given to whatever, the Alameda research operations team that paid the money out to the OTC customers. You know, that's done in batches, right? So the dealer takes in incremental amounts of money and has inventory of tokens that they send out. And every so often, they, however that money gets into bank, whatever, they do that, top up, and then, you know, keep... keep so TLDR, tokens. it's not like $30 billion worth of Tether miraculously yeah. appeared overnight one in one tranche yeah. into an Alameda wallet. Yeah. And it's not like somebody hooked this money yeah. out the bag. That's just yeah. not what happened. It is definitely plausible. There was some uh, Paolo Arduino actually tweeted out <coughs> something about how you know arbitrage is doing some of this. I suspect what's really happening is that the people who are taking in these dollars would prefer to wait until times where Tether is trading above a dollar, and then they can go generate some more Tether mm -hmm. and sell them, get back some mm -hmm. more dollars because. I don't think they're all only taking deposits or only processing withdrawals. You have some amount of float of both dollars and of tokens, and you manage that. And you're going to go in one direction when there's one thing and another direction when there's another. That's all fine. But these people were primarily brokers. The extent to which they stole anybody's money, or he's being accused of stealing people's money, but whatever, colloquially stole people's money, that's exchange deposits. This sort of OTC brokering flows have little to do with that. Is it possible they took a bunch of customer deposits, took those dollars, sent them to Tether, got a bunch of Tether, and did some dodgy stuff with it? I suppose there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of that because it hasn't come up at all in any of the trial deposition paperwork, anything. Also, they wouldn't want to focus on this messy stuff, going after somebody for fraud and stealing the money. I mean, think about... Go watch some of these Genesis Block interviews and think about what must be happening on some level to get this money out of Cambodia, out of Korea, out of the Philippines, Malaysia, take, all countries take that have... to the side of your well, large really, intestine. Really, but like, I mean, he was talking about how people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Korean... There's a discussion, I think, of Koreans going to casinos in the Philippines and they can't take enough money with them through the airport. and Whatever's going on there is probably not <laughs> fantastic and is also going to muddy up the, this, if, this if case. You, have, you just don't want to deal with if that. You have the bunch, if you have a bunch of greenbacks taped to your large intestine, right, you should be... Def that, that's on the inside. <coughs> you, you should be having question, serious questions about your life choices. No, but I mean, some of that stuff <coughs> is really adjacent to proper money mule type things, which I don't think he was directing. He doesn't seem like that character from the movie. No, right? I don't think so. Um, also, it's not relevant to, to what they're going after. Uh, so I don't think that they've just siphoned a tremendous amount of this off on the side. And that's what I think Lord of the Rings, Lord like. of the Rings is the movie I would think of. Okay, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it, so the sort of TLDR on that one is that again, there's some stock versus flow confusion. This, this is and this so, is and these guys were a broker yeah. in addition to being. What so this is one of the things that that you know sometimes when you look at the numbers, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and you know, if I have a dollar, right, I can generate an infinite number of yeah. transactions just by passing it back and forth. That doesn't mean that I have more than a dollar. So it's important to draw those distinctions and and to understand this concept of stock and flow will help to help everybody to kind of understand. Uh, the significance of these things. I think if you go back to terrorist, uh, terrorism financing, I think it's it's um, it's kind of irresponsible of, of uh, anybody to, to say that pff, it's not a big deal. It's a small amount. Well, yeah, that's right. And there's also one other commonality <coughs> between that stuff and this Alameda, Genesis block, whatever, cross-border guys trying to gamble things. How do I say this in a way that's not mean? No one cares about the fucking five basis points, right? Because the fee for doing this stuff, for getting the money across borders and the rest of it, is percent, 10%, percent yeah, 20%. Yeah. So if there's some guy over in the corner arbitrage trading for an extra couple basis points, enjoy yourself. Yep. But that is not what these businesses are doing. It's not what these businesses are about. Yeah. If you run, again, as several of these people have described repeatedly on camera, a business that has people bring bags of money in, and then receive tokens somewhere else so they can go do weird cross-border stuff, the fee for that is not five basis points. Yeah. And it's never going to be five basis points. There's no, Similarly, there's no version. Doing, whatever terrorism financing stuff is going on, I'm assuming the intermediaries are either doing it for free for a different reason or they're getting paid a lot of money. 
right? Because these are expensive intermediation services. You don't have to be a James Bond character to understand that. Um, I mean, why do you think all those dodgy banks in whatever parts of the world look so fancy? Right? Really? Anyway, finally, um, before we go, a little bit of marketing. Uh, 11 days left to the Hong Kong FinTech Week. Guess who's going to be there? We're going to be there. Yay. Okay, um, we'll be at booth number ES010A, if you can find that on the map. Do not if, bring a bag of cash. Do not bring a bag of cash. Um, and if you do, just leave it underneath. Okay, no, don't bring it back. Because then we got to take it to the airport, <laughs> so we're not there. So um, if you happen to be in Hong Kong that week for the Hong Kong FinTech uh, Week, drop by, say hi. Um, and if, you, if, if not, then uh, we'll be actually broadcasting that week's uh, podcast, um, which is a couple of weeks from now. From the hung, uh, from the floor, hopefully of the uh, of the of the actual exhibition. We're not bringing the ridiculous microphones or anything, are we? Uh, it's not in your suitcase anyway. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's all we have for this week. Thank you. To th this week, uh, this week's one uh, episode is a little bit longer than usual, but thank you for watching. Uh, and if you've got any comments or any questions, please hit us up on the uh, comment section below. Otherwise, please like and subscribe. We really appreciate it. it. Helps the algorithm, helps us out as well, so that we can get this information out to more people. Otherwise, have a great weekend. We'll see you again uh, next week. Bye bye. Sounds good. Thank you.